So, I'm going to start. Thank you everyone for being here. So, today we have um, a seminar from the um, Director from the University in Japan, Skype. And um, this is my related subject just at first, but um, this conference is led by the Prevents and also by the um, Instagram Media. So, please uh, welcome to uh, Professor Igata from the University. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kilian, for introducing me. And thank you for coming, everybody. And again, thank you for organizing this, Kilian, and the uh, Deepland team. Thank you very much. And I'd like to talk about this title today, Adaptive Robot Control Using Artificial and Real Cerebral. So I try to capture both France and Japan simultaneously on Earth. And this is the kind of only angle I could capture both countries. And I came from Japan and uh, this area between, this is too small to see, but Tokyo is here. And Osaka, the second largest country in Japan is, uh, second largest city in Japan is here. And we are, here, close to Nagoya, which is the third largest uh, city in Japan, but uh, not so many people know that. But here, I came from here, and our Chubu University campus looks like this from the sky. Okay, and we have uh, like this many uh, students, undergrad, this number, master student, and uh, doctoral student in the entire university. And to start with my uh, talk, I'd like to introduce the relationship between partnership between our university and your institute. Uh, the partnership actually started 2005 and uh, renewed recently 2012 for the next five years of partnership. And so far, 21 uh, students, including Kilian, uh, conducted their internships at two University. And the 22nd student, Niels, is coming to our uh, university uh, in June. And contrary to that, only one two University student uh, visited here in 2007. I don't know the reason and uh, I will advertise the, uh, this beautiful city uh, when I go back to uh, to the university. Okay, and I actually visited five years ago um, in, in July, and at the time I gave a similar talk, I think this auditorium, and uh, yeah, I had a wonderful time. Okay. So today, I'd like to first uh, talk a little bit about the cerebrum, uh, roles in especially motor and motor control. And I will show some examples of uh, cerebellar motor learning, which we like to uh, use for uh, robot control and to build uh, artificial cerebellar. And three and four, I will talk about uh, real cerebellar uh, robot control and artificial cerebellar robot control. In our lab, we do uh, three uh, fields of research. One is neuroscience, specifically uh, neural mechanism of motor learning and predictive control. We mainly use fish, and human subjects. And 
we we make a mathematical model uh, by using the evidence uh, from biological experiment, and we uh, try to um, control robot by uh, brain activities by using uh, this evidence. Also, <clears throat> recently we do a uh, brain state estimation and manipulation. But this is this kind of uh, engineering application, but we uh, recently intensively working on this uh, <clears throat> to find a relationship between hand movements <clears throat> and brain states, which I will be talking a little bit uh, in this uh, presentation. And if you have any question at the middle of my talk, please, uh, please ask. Okay, let's start with the cerebellum. As you may know, uh, cerebellum is over here, behind our ear, and it consists of left and right hemisphere connected with this vermis uh, structure. And as you may know, uh, there are 60, uh, 86 billion neurons in our in the human brain, and 16 billion are in the cerebrum. And uh, in the cerebrum, like four times more uh, neuron number of neurons are in the cerebrum. So that's why we have these many uh, wrinkles in the cerebrum, the, uh, the cerebral cortex. And the function of the cerebrum was uh, learned or revealed from the symptom of the cerebral patients. This figure, picture shows uh, uh, soldiers in 1916, the World War I. Uh, German soldier wore this kind of helmet, which predicted uh, the cerebrum very well, while a British and other uh, countries soldier wore this uh, helmet, which didn't protect the cerebellum. So the soldiers wearing this uh, helmet got those uh, cerebellar injuries quite often. And that's where the roles of the cerebellum was reviewed, revealed. And mainly, uh, cerebellar patients show motor deficits, like they cannot adjust uh, motion magnitude, and they cannot adjust uh, motion velocity, and they present tremor, and they cannot acquire new motor skill. And from these uh, deficits, uh, it is considered that the cerebellum has <coughs> critical roles in motor control and motor learning, and which is equivalent to adaptive motor control in the uh, uh, engineering system. Okay, there are two distinctive characteristics of cerebellar neuronal circuit. One is uh, uniform regardless of the part. So cerebellar neuronal uh, circuitry, basic structure is shown here. And this is summarized uh, what a uh, simpler way over here. So there are uh, basically five types of neurons and two types of input, mostly fiber and climbing fiber. And each neuron types are connected like this. Red means uh, excitatory connections and the blue is uh, inhibitory connections. And only PC, Purkinje cells, output the uh, signal to outside of the cerebellum. And anywhere in the cerebellum, uh, it has this basic uh, neuronal circuitry, the same identical neuronal circuitry. So this is one distinctive characteristics. Ah, and the plasticity. It has a, a neuronal plasticity between um, gold cell and Purkinje cell. Gold cell and Purkinje cell. There is a, a long-term depression and long-term potentiation. And that's considered as a 
basic mechanism of mortal life. The second distinctive, distinctive characteristics is cerebellar neuronal structure uh, is preserved across species. So this is human cerebellum from the back, and this is monkey cerebellum. This is mouse cerebellum over here from the top, and this is goldfish cerebellum, this part. So although the appearance are very different, inside the cerebellum, the basic structure is uh, preserved across the species. So this is the second distinctive uh, characteristics. OK, so to study cerebellar motor learning function, uh, we use uh, this reflective eye movement called vestibular ocular reflex. And this eye movement counter-rotates the eyes in the orbit during head rotation like this. So when we move our head sinusoidally at velocities like this, our eye position moves like this. And uh, by calculating the eye velocity, we get this uh, green, uh, green traces. And we have this uh, very high velocity part, which is here. This is a resetting saccade, which uh, reset our eye position into a uh, uh, movable range of the uh, eye orbit. So, Except for this very rapid resetting saccade part, this green trace shows a very nice sinusoidal curve, which means that uh, eye velocity compensates for head first velocity very well. So if we plot eye velocity versus head velocity, we have very good uh, linear relationship, and the slope is close to one and which is the gain of the VOR, uh, eye velocity over head velocity becomes close to one. Okay, in a uh, real human, eye velocity, VOR is, looks like this. So I am shaking my head up and down, slow and fast. My eyes counter rotates to compensate for uh, head movement. We measure eye movement by using this kind of uh, eye tracker. In Japanese, VR is written like this. So it occurs for vertical direction as well as uh, horizontal direction, and it is quite rapid, fast, short latency uh, reflex. Okay. So, why do we need VR? As you can imagine from this kind of situation, uh, we animals move, and when we move, visual field is disturbed like a video image without image stabilization. And in that case, very difficult to catch or escape without stabilizing the image. That's where the VOR is required uh, to survive. If I'm connected to internet, okay. So this is an example of without VOR, and this is with VOR. And if you can, if you compare those two images, two movies, VOR plays a quite a um, role to stabilize. Okay, so we need VOR <clears throat> to st stabilize our image. 
but not all animals uh, do the same. So in the case of all, they don't move the eye. Instead, they uh, use their neck to stabilize their vision. And uh, kingfisher, ah, oh, sorry. So they can stabilize the head very well. Quite stable. And the last example. So they can do this while they are flying. Very stable. Okay. And birds can do this kind of head stabilization because their head is quite uh, light and uh, they have uh, any degree of freedom in their neck. A turtle can also do the same uh, kind of head stabilization. But our head is too heavy to do that. And uh, the fish we are using, they don't have neck. So they have to, or we have to move the eyes to stabilize uh, our visual field. But there is always an exception. This lady can stabilize <laughs> like, like, like a bird. But not so many people can do this. So that's why we have VOR. OK. <clears throat> so the VOR is kind of fastest uh, reflex because the shortest VR neural circuitry is called a three neural arc. It consists of only uh, three neurons. So our head is detected by semicircular canals and old width. And that signal is uh, sent by scalloped ganglia to secondary vestibular neuron in the vestibular nucleus. And that neuron project to motor neuron in Abdul Sen's nuclei, and this one drives the eye muscles. So only three, three neurons are involved in the latency from head motion to eye movement is less than 10 milliseconds. Let me sidetrack a little bit about the VOR application. Uh, before I'm going to going into uh, robot control. <clears throat> so when I was doing monkey experiment, uh, when monkeys are awake, uh, head velocity stimulation is blue and eye velocity is red. And they are quite well uh, mirror image, that, uh, meaning that VOR is functioning almost perfectly. But when they are sleepy, although the v, uh, head motion is applied, uh, sometimes VOR doesn't occur at all. So when monkey is sleepy, somehow that very simple three neuron arc uh, reflex stops. So we tested in, in human subject by giving the uh, head motion and measuring eye movement like this, oh, it stopped. When they are doing this uh, very monotonous, uneventful, boring uh, simulation, driving simulation. And these figures show the data from the same subject when he was awake and when he became sleepy. So as you can see, when he was awake, head motion in blue is almost a mirror image. Uh, the eye, eye velocity in, in red. So if we plot head velocity versus eye velocity, it has very good uh, linear relationship as we saw before. But after he gets sleepy, the, the slope became uh, 
smaller and the variability increased. Ah. And this plots the uh, VOR gain, which is a slope, and the variability, which is the variability around the regression line. So, and uh, we asked the, uh, our subject participant the level of steepness, which is here. So this colored part, they say they are sleepy. And this white part, they said, uh, or in this case, he said, only one subject, he said uh, not sleepy yet. So when he was not sleepy, the VR gain is high and the variability is low. And when he was, he said sleepy, uh, VR gain decreased and the uh, variability increased. And interestingly, between this period, we saw um, the VR gain started to decrease before he perceived uh, sleepiness, and the variability increased, started to increase when uh, he so he perceived his own sleepiness. So we found that the VR can be a predictor and a detector of the sleepiness. And uh, we patented in uh, eight countries, including this country. So I hope French car company use this uh, technology. And we implemented uh, this algorithm in the iPhone app by using iPhone camera and uh, uh, IMU in the in iPhone. Also, we implemented uh, this technology as an Android app. But there is a one uh, problem, one drawback. We wanted to use this kind of situation um, about the technology, but uh, in this kind of situation, we don't have head motion, which is necessary to induce VOR. So, but recently, one of my students found that heartbeat actually induces head motion. Every time our heart beats, our head moves slightly, especially in the pitch, uh, this direction. So this is actual data, electrocardiogram green, and the head velocity in orange. So every time heart beats, there is a head motion like this, very small, uh, plus minus two degree per second. If we uh, calculate the average over many uh, heartbeats, head moves like this after heartbeat, and eyes moves like this in the mirror image of head motion. And uh, the gain and the variability actually decrease when the subject was sleepy, and the variability increase when the subject was sleepy. So I think we think uh, we can apply this technology to this kind of situation in the, in the auditorium or in the classroom or in the office. Okay, let's go back to the uh, real part of my talk. So viewer is a shortest uh, neuronal, a viewer shortest neural circuit. It's only three neural net and it's quite fast. But actual, uh, sorry, yeah. actual neural uncertainty is more complex than that. And uh, from uh, semicircular canal to eye, there are many neurons involved, including the cerebral over here. So since this is a very fast feed-forward uh, control system, like this, and uh, by the way, VR works in the dark too. So even though we don't see anything in the dark, uh, VR occurs when when the head motion is uh, given. So characteristics of the sensors. 
semicircular canals, ultimately. And actuator muscles uh, change over time due to development and aging, etc. Et so in order to maintain the precise eye movement, gain of one, uh, the viewer control system needs to be adaptively change its control, its motor command uh, to function properly, ensuring eye velocity is equal to minus head velocity. And to do this adaptive uh, control, the cerebrum is required. So to study the VOR adaptation motor learning in the lab, we do this kind of uh, experimental partner. So in natural situation, uh, the visual stimulation outside doesn't move, so only head is moved and the visual stimulation is zero. And when we turn off the light and no visual stimulation, eye velocity moves like this as a mirror image of the head velocity. So this is a natural situation. When we want to increase the VOR gain, we give this kind of visual stimulation together with head velocity. So head is moving like this, and the visual stimulation is uh, 180 degree out of phase, like this. And after like 30 minutes of this stimulation, uh, by turning off the visual stimulation, the eye velocity becomes faster than this normal case. So this is a gain up paradigm. And the gain down paradigm, we give uh, this kind of visual stimulation, which is in phase with the eye head velocity. So after 30 minutes or so, in the dark without visual stimulation, eye velocity becomes slow, slower. Okay. And this VR adaptation has been found in these animal models too. So from uh, monkey to fish, uh, they all have VR and they all have uh, this adaptation mechanism. So in the case of the fish in our lab, we give uh, this kind of uh, visual stimulation by using uh, planetarium and head motion uh, together with uh, water tank. So gain up paradigm, uh, head is moves together with the water term, and the visual stimulation is given like this, and gain down paradigm, uh, we give this stimulation. And it's been shown that without the cerebrum, VR is generated, but no adaptation occurs. So this is an example of a learning curve. Uh, after gain up training, so it's uh, two hours gain up training, we tested uh, the VR game in the dark after like 30 minutes, one hour, no, this, this is like 15 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, 90 minutes, 120. So the VR game gradually decreases in the dark. This is gain up training, and this is gain down training, so they can uh, increase and decrease the gain like this. And recently we asked this question, can, we, can VR adapt in the opposite direction at two different frequencies? Meaning that, for example, gain up at high frequency 0.5 Hz and gain down at 0.1 Hz simultaneously can fish and other animals do this. So we tested it in goldfish by giving this kind of stimulation. So to induce a gain down at low frequency, we give this uh, in-phase head and visual stimulation motion. And to increase uh, the gain at high, high frequency, we give this out of phase uh, stimulation. And by combining these uh, two stimulations, we, dis we got this uh, sum of signs, head velocity, and the visual 
stimulus velocity and actual motion is like this. And the question is if the fish can increase the 0.5 Hz gain and decrease the 1.1 Hz gain at the same time. And the answer was yes. Um, normal fish with the cerebellum uh, the gain at 0.5 Hz increased and at the same time gain at 0.1 Hz decrease. But when we eliminate the cerebellum, which is here, so after elimination of the cerebellum, the fish uh, didn't change uh, the VOR gain like this. It increased a little bit, but not significant. Okay. So when we recorded the neuronal activity from the fish cerebellum during this sum of sign task, uh, Perkinji cell, which is the output cell of the cerebellum, showed this kind of firing activity. And the red is a firing rate. And this shows the eye velocity of the, of the fish. So uh, the red firing rate is looks close to the uh, fine uh, eye velocity uh, shape waveform. This shows the simpler example, which probably more clearly shows the relationship between eye velocity and the Perkinji cell firing rate. So actually, this. Uh, cerebellar Perkinji cell activity has been shown that uh, firing pattern can be reconstructed by a linear sum of eye acceleration, velocity, and position. So for example, like this uh, equation, Perkinji firing rate is equal to uh, alpha times eye acceleration plus beta times eye velocity, gamma times eye position plus PC term and the noise. So this shows the example. Uh, cyan trace is the firing rate of the Perkinji cell. And this one is eye position trace. And this one is eye velocity. This is eye acceleration. And the linear combination of these gives this blue uh, reconstructed uh, firing rate. So, it's been known since this time, 30 years ago, and this means that, uh, well, eye muscle dynamics has been shown that uh, it can be characterized, approximated by this kind of uh, second order low pass filter system. And as you can see, uh, Perkinji cell firing pattern can be reconstructed by using uh, eye movement like this. So if this alpha is equal to A and beta is equal to B and gamma is equal to C, we can get uh, this eye movement from uh, Perkinji cell firing pattern through uh, eye muscle dynamics. Uh, more Precisely, it's been proposed that uh, the cerebrum acquires internal model of the control object. So it was back in 1992, they proposed this hypothesis. So the cerebrum is over here, and control object in the case of VOR, it is a high muscle system, and the target motion is uh, minus eight velocity, and produced motion is high velocity. So this is VOR system. And it has a negative uh, feedback system controller over here. So this is a feedback loop, which in the light, this is shows uh, retinal sleep, which I will explain later. And the cerebellum is located here in the uh, parallel path to the uh, feedback controller. So if the cerebellum learns, acquires the internal model of this control object, if this is a GS, the uh, transfer function, and 
cerebellum acquires uh, inverse of G, GS, then this loop gives a uh, feed forward uh, control system to get the uh, a minus end velocity is equal to I velocity. And in that case, you don't have to rely on this feedback loop anymore, and you can use this feed forward fast control system. So this is an internal model hypothesis, and uh, we wanted to test this. So if the internal, uh, internal model states that, for example, different part of uh, cerebral regions put, uh, responsible for controlling the different parts of our body. So for example, this part uh, is responsible for controlling the eyes, and this part uh, is responsible for controlling the arm. Let's assume that. And if the internal model hypothesis is true, if we rewire this part, which is responsible for uh, controlling the eye, to the arm part, then eventually after learning, this part will be acquiring an uh, internal model of arm instead of eyes. But technically, to test this kind of uh, structure is very difficult, impossible. So instead, we try to uh, control we try to connect this part of the cerebral activity to the external uh, robot or simple robot arm like this through cerebral machine interface. Okay. To do that, uh, we used uh, the vestibular ocular reflex VOR adaptation mechanism. So to simply explain how VOR adapt, it reduces or minimizes uh, slip on the retina. So normally, head velocity is given and the VOR system produces the uh, motor command to drive the eye. And if the eye velocity is mirror image to the head velocity, then retinal slip is very small. So this is a comparison and the difference is very small. So no retinal slip, no visual blowing. And during the learning paradigm, we, we give external visual stimulation like this. And then retinal slip increase. And that's a trigger to uh, to to uh, drive the learning mechanism in the VOR system. Then the eye velocity becomes uh, larger and the lateral sleep becomes uh, small. So this is a VOR adaptation mechanism which minimizes the image of the retina. So we use this system, a uh, cerebral machine interface system, to test the uh, internal model hypothesis. Okay, it is kind of complicated. So I hope your VOR is still working. Uh, fish is over here. And uh, fish is fixated in the uh, water tank. And this part is just the uh, expansion of the fish eye, semicircular canal, and, uh, and the cerebral, and other neuronal circuit. So first, uh, the desired motion of this control object is given as a, a rotation of fish tank, which is equal to rotation of fish head. Then when uh, head is moved, the goldfish attempt to move its eyes to compensate for the head rotation. However, the fish eyes are actually fixated, so fish eyes do not move. 
and we measure the Perkins cell, cerebellar Perkins cell activity, and which involves in the control, usually to control the eye movement, we record from one of those Perkins cells. And by using the cerebellar machine interface to decode the motor command information, which is to move the eyes from the Parkinji cell activity, and that activity is converted it to control uh, this control object, which uses a uh, uh, pulse width, pulse width modulation signal. So it just uh, receives a firing rate and converted it to a PWM signal. Then the control object moves, rotates, but that uh, uh, rotation is not designed, not equal to desired motion, because the signal from here is to move the eyes, not to move the control object. So there is a difference between uh, produced motion and desired motion. And that difference is calculated and used to drive move this uh, visual stimulation. And the visual stimulation causes uh, retinal slip because fish eyes doesn't move uh, because it's fixated. And that retinal slip drives the visual adaptation. So the adaptation process of the VR begins in the cerebellum. And the Parkinson itself responsible for the motor lining change their neuronal activity to minimize the uh, retinal slip image. In other, in other words, the motor command should change so that the produced motion of the control object approaches the desired motion. Okay, this is actual system. Uh, fish is fixated over here, and the uh, water tank is rotated, and we record it from one of the Purkinje cells, uh, firing rate like this, and uh, we count the number of fire, firing, and generate the PWM signal, and give that PWM to uh, robot control, robot down. And we uh, count the encoder powers and uh, compare the desired motion versus uh, produce motion, and the difference uh, drives this uh, visual stimulation. Okay, this is the result. Uh, this is the first part of the experiment, uh, first like 60 second. The Perkins cell activity is like this, and the firing rate is like this. And desired motion in this case is sinusoidal Dot line, red dot line, and the produced motion is this green line. And this is the difference between uh, red and green. So initially, it's uh, quite a big error. But after one hour of this CMI, cerebellar machine interface training, now the red and green becomes quite close, and the error becomes um, small. So the result shows that cerebellar Purkinje cells responsible for controlling eye movement, VOR, can adapt to control a DC, DC motor as, a predicted, as predicted by the internal model hypothesis. Does it make sense? If you have any question, I'm happy to answer. Okay, let's move on to the adaptive control by artificial cerebellum. Okay, so neural circuitry and uh, synaptic plasticity mechanism have been identified very well in the case of the cerebellar cortex. And there are uh, many types of neural models proposed. <laughs> and uh, artificial cerebellum can be constructed by using these uh, ethics and uh, neural model. So that's what we have been working on. And we have built, uh, built this uh, artificial cerebellum uh, with uh, non-spiking neural models. 
So as I showed, the basic cellular neuronal circuitry is like this, and which can be uh, displayed like this. And each neuron is described by a uh, usual uh, artificial neuron uh, whose uh, activator, activation function is in this case sigmoid, not the uh, rare root. And each neuron has uh, similar uh, equations but different parameters. And we implement the uh, synaptic plasticity, which is known in the cellular cortex. And we introduced the 3D uh, structure in the cerebral cortex, uh, like this. And we used this artificial cerebral model in the framework of this internal model hypothesis. So there is a feedback PD controller, and the cerebral model is in parallel with this uh, feedback controller. And we try to control this uh, uh, two-wheel balancing robot and eat this uh, DC motor and uh, drone, in this case, uh, simulation. So this is an example of two-wheel balancing robot. This shows only a feedback controller without the cerebral. So after we put the load, on the robot, the robot cannot continue the control. With the cerebral, we put the same load, extra load on top of the robot. It's kind of wobbly, but uh, it can co continue the control like this by using a cellular adaptive mechanism. And this shows another example. In this case, uh, the pedestal changed the angle, but the cerebral controller can handle that kind of environmental change. Like this. Oh, oh this was only. Uh, PD controller. From here, the cerebellar control starts. After one minute or so, it will. The, the pedestal changes the angle like this, and it can continue. the control, if you really Okay. Yeah. So, so this is by a non-spiking neuron, artificial model, artificial cerebral. And we try to uh, implement spiking neuron model to use uh, in a real-time robot control. Uh, for that, spike neuron needs uh, more uh, calculation, uh, more uh, more calculation resources. And for that, uh, usual PC is not uh, capable of that. So we try to implement the spike neural model on the FPGA. And as probably many of you know, that the FPGA has this uh, kind of advantages over CPU, GPU. So we try to implement our cerebral model onto FPGA in a spiking neuron models and use it as a same uh, configuration as the previous uh, robot control. There is a PD controller, feedback controller, and also in parallel uh, FPGA cerebral controller like this. So when we try to adaptively control this DC motor, which has a load, 
uh, the same DC motor as a road like this. And without the cerebral control, uh, only PD controller uh, error was like this. And uh, after turning on the load, the error increased and the PD controller cannot reduce the error. In contrast, artificial cerebral controller uh, reduced the uh, error like this, and uh, even after the load on, uh, it increased, the error increased uh, this much, but uh, after that, decreased again. So this is uh, our uh, first first uh, result by using a uh, spike neuron cerebral model. So just after this, this result, Kinian came to our lab and he tried to fly uh, the, the real drone by using the spiking neuron cerebral model. And for that, uh, he first uh, implemented our spiking neuron model onto a newer uh, FPGA. And he did that quite quickly. And he tried to make an interface with the drone and the cerebral model. And uh, he spent like uh, five months in our lab and he did a lot and uh, he achieved a lot. But uh, the, the period was not enough to completely fly uh, the drone by the end of his uh, internship. So this is what he mentioned in his uh, internship report. I just copy and paste without his permission. Can I read? Yes. <laughs> About the results, my work leads to a complete update of the big project I received. Additionally, I initiated and developed useful and required tools, ensuring that the individual who follows in my footsteps can concentrate on the cerebral aspect and on the quadcopter controller with a commitment to commenting and documenting all my work in English. I have confidence that anyone can easily utilize the fruit of my work. So, Niels, <laughs> you are in a very good position to complete this uh, project. Okay, do I still have time? I have four minutes? Okay. So, Kirian attended uh, many projects in our lab actually, like this. So, what he's doing, I will explain that. So, in Japanese, very uh, popular. Uh, do I have a sound? Uh, echoing. So, this is the French version of Drum Ball I found uh, on YouTube. And in Dragon Ball, under hypergravity, Goku can train very effectively under hypergravity. So we tested that <laughs> by creating this uh, centrifuge. We had like a 3G, but 3G was too high, so we just increased a uh, decrease the G to 2G. So under 2G, we did this uh, prism adaptation arm reaching paradigm. So the prism shift your vision like this. Prism on, off, on, off. So this prism shift your vision to the left like a 17 degree. So when we wear this, and this is a ball, throwing ball uh, paradigm. So with that prism, the subject can throw very close to the target. So this is a target. And when the subject wear the goggle, at first the throw deviates much to the left, for example. And when, as, the, as she or he throw the ball many times, the distance from the target decreases like this. Okay, so this is a learning curve. If the learning is occur quickly, uh, learning curve comes below. And if the learning is slow, learning curve goes above 
like this, right? So <clears throat> we did that, and this is one subject. Uh, this is a learning curve on the 1G when he went through uh, eight times on the 1G experiment repeatedly. And on the 2G, the learning curve became like this, the same subject. So other four subjects showed the same uh, characteristics. So on the 2G, the learning occurred faster than under 1G. So the drop ball was correct. So what Kirian was doing is to test what happened if the minus 1G condition is imposed to, uh, to subject. So when we do this kind of posture, our gravity sensor in the inner area detect minus 1G and we throw in the ball. But this is very difficult task. Most of the throwing is out, outside of the white ball, so we couldn't measure. And uh, well, he, he threw it very well, but other subject couldn't. So we have not enough data to show you today. So probably, hopefully next time. Okay, this is the last slide I showed you five years ago uh, with uh, Francois. Uh, he came to our lab when was that? May 2019. And uh, during pandemic, we applied a grant to this uh, private organization, and we got uh, a grant. And the project field is in French, is like this, in Japanese, like this. Very general title. And uh, I got, we got this grant, and uh, that's how I came to this, uh, this institute this time. And this is my last slide. I hope uh, to continue our collaboration. Uh, I hope for more and more research collaborations between our institution from now on. And I, I like to notice that uh, the size different <laughs> the size of the beer glass. And this is uh, they, they are my uh, lab members in 2003, 2020. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, so, uh, do you have a question? So, yeah. So, just uh, even if you have just preliminary results, but do you see a big difference between using non spiking neurons or spiking? Uh, the performance, I mean, uh, we, we actually, we haven't tried uh, the same control paradigm between non-spiking and spiking. Yeah, we should do that. We just did a very simple, uh, this control uh, scheme in uh, spiking. So probably Niels will do the com com comparison. Thank you for the question. Um, I do have a question for the professor. Uh, why, how do you manage to do the scaling uh, of the different cells uh, inside your uh, models? Different cell? Yeah. Ah. Did you choose the numbers of uh, uh, global cells, uh, RPG cells, and so on? Right. So your question was how do we manage? The difference? Yes. Okay. Ah, I see. J by just uh, defining the different parameters to to reproduce the experimental data, like firing rate, DC firing rate, or maximum firing rate, and yeah, that kind of uh, uh, physiological data. To, to reproduce those characteristics, we just adjust the parameters. So told us about the plasticity of the, the cells. How much is it important uh, in the uh, CNN to prevent plasticity or not? Uh, How much does it change the, if you try to do the um, 
Yeah, without plasticity, uh, let's see, which one is, yeah, this one probably, learning curve. Without plasticity, you don't see these degrees. So plasticity is important. Plasticity is definitely important, yeah, to reduce the error. So the plasticity mechanism is driven by the error, to, and uh, to minimize the error, the plasticity is driven. Yes, yes, and this uh, prism adaptation is known that the uh, cerebellum is actually involved for this uh, prism adaptation. So the cerebellum has something to do with that. And uh, we found that by, uh, we, we expect that, we assume that uh, greater gravity causes more larger input to the cerebellum because cerebellar neurons receive a signal from autopist, which is a gravity sensor. So the more gravity, more input to the cerebellum. That makes probably uh, Purkinje cell activity greater. And when the greater Purkinje cell activity occurs, and then the motor learning probably becomes more promoted. That's what we, we are thinking. But it's very difficult to record from neurons under hypergravity when the water tank is rotating like this. It's because it's wobbly and it's very difficult to maintain the recording. So instead, we just record it from the Perkins cell of the fish and we just turn on and off the visual stimulation. And somehow we saw that if we turned on the light, visual stimulation, per, without any movement of the visual stimulation, Perkinjusel activity is promoted. So the DC firing rate is higher than those in the dark. So just turn on, turn on the light makes the Perkinjusel firing rate increased. So we thought that that's the same effect as uh, hypergravity. We assume that hypergravity causes the Purkinje cell firing rate more. Right? So under that light environment, we train the fish. I move, and the goldfish showed the faster learning under the uh, under the light bright environment. And we also check the goldfish under hypergravity, and under hypergravity, goldfish also showed faster learning as human showed. So the conclusion is uh, if the cerebellar activity is promoted, higher activity by the uh, hypergravity, then the motor learning is somehow accelerated. So we don't have to use actually uh, hypergravity if we can uh, increase the activity of the cellular, cellular neurons by using other stimulation. So one of them is a light. If you train yourself under bright light condition, you can probably get the motor skill faster than in the dark environment, which we haven't checked. But uh, uh, as long as the uh, fish case, it is true. So thank you for your presentation. And um, after our presentation, we had a um, small prepared presentation. So let's see, Richard, you are welcome to, to, to come. And, 
uh, it's allowed to drink yes. alcohol <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> that's nice <laughs> Where? Uh, uh, you, you can you can uh, the slide. Oh, J'ai cru que tu voulais prendre la photo de la place de Maxime. Maybe not. Front, back. Um, I think the here is good. Some people in front, some people here. We want this here. That's yours. Can you share it with me? Yeah, I will send you. Do you want us to take a picture with your phone? Well, if if you send it, okay, to me, that's fine. Thank you. Tu m'envoies les photos et je lui transmets. Yeah, just say them that you send me the pictures for me to send you them. Okay. okay. Oh, do you Let's want the pictures just to, to, to us? Okay. Let's do that. <laughs> okay. Wait, 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 wait. wait. No, no, don't worry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Like that, uh, Francois is also here. <laughs> yes. So you already meet with Nils? Nils, yes, this morning. Yes. How was it? <laughs> This morning, I just wanted to 